West of the city of Portland, Maine, about a quarter hour's drive by car, lies the village of Gorham. Just north of the village is Fort Hill, and it was here on November the 26th, 1827, that twin girls, Ellen and Elizabeth, were born to Robert and Eunice Harmon. The Harmons were devout Methodists with eight children to care for. Though their home no longer stands today, this marker indicates its approximate location. Later, the family moved to the seaside city of Portland, where Robert Harmon continued his hat-making trade and young Ellen attended the Brackett Street School. But at the age of nine, her life was to take a dramatic turn at the hands of a jealous schoolgirl. You're a cheat, Ellen. I'll get you! Ellen was carried to her home in Clark Street, where it was soon discovered that her nose was broken and every feature of her face had changed. She lay in a coma for three weeks. On recovering a little, she soon discovered the difference her appearance made to the way others treated her. Ellen Harmon made several attempts to resume her schooling but the results of the accident made it almost impossible to study and retain what she learned. Her hand trembled so much she could make no progress in writing and with great reluctance she eventually gave up all attempts to gain a formal education. During this lonely and discouraging period she spent many pleasant hours here in the woods of Deering Oaks Park. In March 1840, William Miller came to Portland and presented a series of lectures on the second coming of Christ at the church that once stood on this site in Casco Street. The Harmon family attended his meetings, and Ellen later wrote of Miller, He traced down the prophecies with an exactness that brought convictions and held the crowds as if spellbound. In June 1842, Ellen Harmon and 11 others were baptised and received into the fellowship of the Methodist Church that once stood nearby this present Methodist Church in Chestnut Street. But her joyful Christian experience was interspersed with times of despondency. Nevertheless, Miller's second visit to Portland confirmed her confidence in the soon coming of Jesus, a confidence that she enthusiastically shared. However, the Harmon's acceptance of Miller's teachings did not meet with the approval of their church. Here is the record of the quarterly business meeting that was conducted in September 1843. The pastor arose and stated that Robert Harmon and his family, including Ellen Harmon, had entered an appeal from the decision of a committee by which they had been expelled from the church. It was unanimously voted to sustain the decision of the committee in his expulsion. Ellen Harmon often claimed that the year 1844 was the happiest of her life. Yet with tens of thousands of others, the Harmon family suffered bitter disappointment when Jesus did not come on October 22. By December 1844, most Advent believers had given up their confidence in the validity of October 22. Ellen Harmon and her friends had accepted that the fulfilment of the 2,300 year prophecy must still be in the future. It was in that same month that Ellen received the first of some 2,000 visions and prophetic dreams that God would give her over the next 70 years. During these visions, she was totally unconscious of her surroundings, 
And like the prophet Daniel envisioned, she did not breathe throughout the time of the revelation. The visions varied in length from a very short duration to nearly four hours. Some were given in public before a few or up to hundreds of eyewitnesses. These were generally accompanied by marked physical phenomena during the first 30 years of her ministry that provided strong evidence to those that witnessed them that the work was of God. Others were given during prayer, writing or speaking and were unaccompanied by physical phenomena. However, during the last 40 years of her ministry, the visions were usually prophetic dreams given during the night. J. N. Loughborough, a church pioneer, saw her in public vision on some 50 occasions. He wrote that at the beginning of a vision, the word glory was repeated three times, but each time more faintly. Initially, she lost strength and consciousness, but was then able to walk about the room. She would sometimes make gestures with her arms and hands, but those present were not able to move them in any way. Her eyes were open while she looked upward, appearing to be gazing intently at some faraway object. Though she did not breathe, her pulse was regular and the colour of her face remained normal. At the end of the vision, her surroundings appeared to be in total darkness. Her power to see even the brightest objects returned only gradually. Hello. Hi, Ellen. Just prior to her first vision in December 1844, Ellen's health rapidly worsened. Tuberculosis, it seemed, would take her life. In this condition, she responded to an invitation from a close friend, Mrs. Elizabeth Haynes, to visit in her home just across the bridge in South Portland. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his needs among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye about his wondrous works, glory ye in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Shall we kneel in prayer? One morning, three other young women joined Ellen and Mrs. Haynes for worship. As they knelt in prayer, the power of God came upon Ellen and she was wrapped in a vision of God's glory. She experienced the sense of rising higher and higher above the earth. She says she turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them. Directed to look up, she saw a straight and narrow path on which they were travelling to the holy city. Behind them was a bright light which an angel told her represented the midnight cry of the Millerite movement. This light shone all along the path and prevented them from stumbling. Ahead they saw Jesus leading them to the city, and like Peter on the water, so long as they kept their eyes on him, they were safe. As the vision continued, she viewed the second coming of Jesus along with the resurrection of God's people. She also witnessed the ascent to the New Jerusalem and saw some of its beauties. When Ellen shared this revelation with her four friends, it seemed to answer some of the questions that were troubling them. Was the experience of the disappointment one in which God had led? Was October 22 a fulfilment of prophecy or a grand delusion? A narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city. The vision affirmed that the message fixed on the time, October 22, was in the providence of God. It was described as light behind them that shone all the way to the city. Significantly, this light was set at the beginning of the path. 
They had hoped that it marked the end of the road. It was good news, however, to know that Jesus knew all about their experience and would continue to guide all who kept their eyes on him. They were safe. About a week later, she was given a second vision in which God formally called her to work as his messenger. She was also shown the trials and opposition she would bear. This vision troubled her, for she was all too conscious of her youthfulness, timidity and constant ill health. She also feared her own pride. Nevertheless, she accepted God's reassurance and began to share what he had shown her. At this, I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the Among those who heard her early in 1845 was William Foy. Adventists were traveling to the city, which was on the further end of the path. The Lord showed me that exact same vision. That's just what I saw. Throughout Ellen's two-hour description, William Foy repeatedly confirmed the account of her vision. Early in 1845, Ellen Harmon travelled throughout eastern Maine to meet with the Advent believers there. In February, while visiting Exeter, she was given a significant vision. It was a view of the heavenly sanctuary in which she saw the Father rise from his throne and enter the most holy place. Jesus followed him there and appeared before him as a great high priest to receive his kingdom. This vision was not published until the March 14, 1846 issue of the Day Star, which was some five weeks after the issue in which Edson, Crozier and Hahn had published the results of their Bible study on the sanctuary. In a startling way, this vision confirmed the explanation they had found during the months following October 22, 1844. Here is a significant illustration of the relationship that existed between the prophetic gift and the study of the scriptures. The gift was not given as a substitute for Bible study, nor were the teachings of the church obtained from the visions. Rather, the visions confirmed the results of the Bible study. A further illustration of this can be seen in connection with the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath. Early in 1846, Ellen Harmon had met Joseph Bates. Bates had just begun to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath and was enthusiastically sharing it with all who would listen. Yet Ellen wrote of him, I find him to be a true Christian gentleman, courteous and kind, but I feel that he errs in dwelling upon the Fourth Commandment more than the other nine. In August 1846, Bates published his 48-page tract the Seventh-day Sabbath, a perpetual sign, in which he outlined the Bible reasons for its observance. Father, we pray now that your spirit would abide with us as we study thy holy word. We ask that we might be drawn closer to truth and wisdom. On August 30, 1846, Amen. Ellen Harmon married a young Millerite preacher, James White. Not long after this, James and Ellen White studied Bates's tract. They compared its contents with scripture and began to observe the Seventh-day Sabbath and to teach it to others. At that time, there were about 50 Sabbath keepers in New England and in the state of New York. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Some months later, they were visiting in the home of fellow Adventist and successful civil engineer Stockbridge Howland in Topsom, Maine. It was here, early in April 1847, that Ellen was given another vision of the heavenly sanctuary. After viewing the holy place, she passed into the sanctuary's second apartment. There she saw the Ten Commandments with a halo of light focused upon the Fourth Commandment. James and Ellen White had already accepted the Sabbath 
solely on biblical evidence. However, the vision of April the 3rd, 1847, given some months after they had begun to observe it, confirmed their decision and impressed upon them its importance. While living in Topsom, the Whites accepted an invitation to attend a conference at Rocky Hill, Connecticut in the Albert Belden home. This conference was later identified by James White as the first general meeting held by Seventh-day Adventists, though they had not yet adopted that name. It was also the first of some 20 weekend Bible conferences conducted between April 1848 and December 1850. It was during these meetings that the major teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were forged, using the same methods Luther did at the Diet of Worms, Scripture, Reason and Conscience. James and Ellen White, Joseph Bates, Hiram Edson and others led out in the Bible studies and prayer seasons that often continued through the entire night. It is important to consider Ellen White's role during these conferences. When the group came to a point in their study when they could progress no further, she would be given a vision in which a clear explanation of the passages being studied was presented. Her contributions were particularly impressive because all knew that when not in vision, she could not understand their reasoning. Throughout Ellen White's life, it is evident that the visions were not given to her to replace Bible study. Late in 1888, she wrote, God wants us to go to the Bible and get the scripture evidence. As the church's pioneers became more and more unified on the great themes they were studying, they began to see the need for publishing them. During a conference held in Dorchester, just south of Boston, Massachusetts, in November of 1848, Ellen received a vision that was to launch the church into an ambitious program. After the vision, she told her husband to publish a little paper and send it out to the people. From this small beginning, she said she saw that it would be like streams of light that would go clear around the world. It was an impressive challenge to present to a handful of poverty-stricken young believers. In the following year, 1849, this little paper, The Present Truth, was published in Connecticut. James White brought a thousand copies to Albert Belden's home where a small group prayed for God's blessing. The following year, the periodical was replaced by the Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. Known today as Adventist Review, its message is read around the world. In 1875, the Whites were here in Battle Creek, Michigan, to attend a biblical institute and the dedication of the church's first college. Shortly before the dedication, Ellen fell very ill with influenza. Fearing for her life, some of the church's leaders met for prayer, during which she was not only healed, but also given a 10-minute vision. In this vision, she saw the world enshrouded in darkness. Then, through the gloom, she saw glimmering lights which burned brighter and brighter, lighting other lights until the whole world was lit up. In a later account of this vision, she spoke of seeing printing presses operating all over the world. At that time, the church was operating only one publishing house in Battle Creek. Intrigued, James White interrupted her and asked if she remembered the names of any countries where she had seen these presses in operation. No, I do not know the names, but if I should ever see them, I would recognize them. Oh, I do remember one. The angel said Australia. Late in 1891, Ellen White herself came to Australia. Soon after her arrival, she visited the printing establishment that had been set up in Best Street, Melbourne. She recognised the people working the presses 
and spoke of the relationships between them based upon the revelation given 17 years before. The gift of prophecy was not given, however, only to guide the work of the church and enlarge its vision. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul warned the church that it was engaged in a struggle against the devil schemes and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Another important function, therefore, of the prophetic gift is to protect the church from the deceptions and attacks of its enemy. Ten minutes' drive from Hiram Edson's home is the birthplace in Hydesville, New York, of modern spiritualism. It was here on March the 31st, 1848, that the Fox family first heard mysterious rapping sounds. Communication was soon established with the intelligence behind the rappings. It was supposedly the spirit of a peddler who had been murdered here many years before. Later in 1848, the first public demonstrations of the rappings were given in Rochester, New York. Within a decade, Newspapers estimated the number of believers in the spirit manifestations to be more than a million, with the number of mediums to be 40,000 in the United States alone. Ellen White was warned against these Rochester wrappings in a vision she had in 1849. I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York and other places is the power of Satan, and that such things will become more and more common, being clothed in a religious garb. Some 18 months later, she was given another vision concerning the same phenomena. Soon it will be considered blasphemy to speak against the rapping, for it will spread more and more. And even the miracles performed by Christ himself will be attributed to such spiritualistic phenomena. The remarkable fulfillment of these predictions is seen in this volume, 100th Anniversary of Modern Spiritualism, published by the National Spiritualist Association of the United States in 1948. Here on page 68 it states, A medium foretold the birth of Jesus, whose brief life on earth was filled with the performance of many so-called miracles, which in reality were spiritual phenomena. And what about blasphemy to speak against the wrappings? Page 34, Neither priest nor press should uncharitably speak of or touch this holy word spiritualism, only with clean hands and pure hearts. Has it become clothed in a religious garb? On page 69 we read, Spiritualism is the coming universal religion. It is the lifeblood of Christianity. In fact, it is Christianity plus. Ellen White also spoke about the power Satan has to bring before us the appearance of forms purporting to be friends and relatives whom we know to be dead. In J.B. Phillips' book, Ring of Truth, a translator's testimony, the well-known translator of the New Testament tells of his meeting with the famous Christian writer, C.S. Lewis. The notable fact about this meeting is that it occurred a few days after Lewis's death. When Phillips shared this experience with a church bishop, he was told that it happens all the time. In 1861, the United States stood on the brink of a crisis. Prior to Saturday, January 12, four southern states had seceded from the Union, but no one expected war. It was not until three months later that President Lincoln called for an army. But God knew the future and warned his people of what was coming. Sabbath, January 12, 1861, was a happy occasion for the Parkville Seventh-day Adventist Church in Michigan. Their new church building was to be dedicated, and several of the denomination's leaders, including James and Ellen White, were present. In the afternoon, near the end of her address, Ellen White was given a vision which lasted some 20 minutes. Invited to tell what she had seen, she solemnly warned that other states would join in the secession and a terrible war would be the result. She described the sounds and sights of battle and the sufferings of the sick and wounded prisoners in hospitals. 
She saw homes in distress because of the loss of husbands, sons and brothers. Then, as she looked into the faces of her congregation, she paused. There are those here today who will lose sons in that war. Three months after the vision at Parkville, the first shots were fired that launched America into the agony of its civil war. More American lives were lost than in all other American wars combined. At least five families present that afternoon in 1861 lost sons in the war. Revelation 12, 17 identifies the testimony of Jesus as being one of two distinguishing characteristics possessed by God's people just prior to the second coming of Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus? In Revelation 19, John quotes an angel saying that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And in Revelation 1, John explains that what he writes as a prophet is a message that comes from God through Jesus Christ by his angel. And so a prophet's words are called Jesus' testimony, for they come from Jesus and not from the prophet. A striking example of this process working through Ellen White can be seen in the early experience of the Washington, New Hampshire church. It was here in 1844 that William Farnsworth had declared his intention to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, and a Sabbath-keeping congregation had been established in the community. But during the following years, some in the group began to lose their faith. William Farnsworth himself had returned to using tobacco, and other senior members had become cynical and critical. This was discouraging many of the youth of the church. Something was desperately needed to restore church unity and faith. Just before Christmas, 1867, the Whites and Jay and Andrews visited Washington. They stayed in Cyrus Farnsworth's comfortable home here by Millen Pond, arriving late on Friday afternoon. On the Monday morning, Ellen White gave an address during which she began to speak personally to those in the room. Her words were so direct and meaningful to each one that it was evident that their life experiences had been shown to her by God. Among the group was 19-year-old Eugene Farnsworth, one of William Farnsworth's 22 children. He knew what others did not know, that his father had resumed using tobacco. If she's a messenger of the Lord, he thought to himself, she will know about my father. Shortly afterward, Mrs. White addressed William and said she had seen in vision that he was a slave to tobacco and that he had been, and I quote, trying to deceive everyone into thinking he had discarded it. Eugene Farnsworth realised he was witnessing the prophetic gift in action. After she had finished speaking, all those addressed stood and testified to the truth of her revelations about them. With repentance, they rededicated their lives to God. Eighteen young people also made a commitment to Christ. Nine of the eighteen later became full-time workers in the church, and among them was Eugene Farnsworth. He served as a church evangelist and administrator in the United States, Australia, New Zealand and Britain. Why did God send his messenger to their church? Why has God bestowed the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy upon his remnant people? The answer to both questions is the same. The Old Testament's answer is found in 2 Chronicles 36, 15, because God has compassion upon his people. The New Testament explains it even more fully in Ephesians 4, verses 12 and 13. God calls some to be prophets, in order to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. In 
Ellen Gould White, wife, mother, writer, God's messenger. Chosen while still the weakest of the weak, she became a tower of strength to a group of people called by God in the last days of this world's history, the Seventh-day Adventist Church.